Hello, my name is Dr. Edwin Lee. I'm at the 2018 Age Management Medicine Group in Orlando, Florida. And today I have the privilege to interview Dr. Andrew Campbell, who is an immunologist and also in toxicology. And uh, it's been a, pl it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank um, you. And you have a talk pretty soon, so can you give me a little... Sure. Uh, my talk is going to focus on mold slash mycotoxins and the effect uh, they have on the neurological system, um, the whole body, but really focusing on neurological system as well as uh, neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer and Parkinson's. And we'll be reviewing uh, the studies. There's um, about 30 studies that, that are part of the uh, presentation. Uh, that is all evidence-based, obviously, and uh, we're going to let uh, doctors um, learn about not only how to detect this in their patients, but we want to also teach them what to do after they've done that. Well, that's great. I'm actually really looking forward to uh, listening to your talk and learning about molds, and because uh, I, I think I have uh, several patients that uh, have uh, basically are still has it and uh, they're str struggling. I know personally when we moved into Orlando, we were renting a, um, a little townhouse and I got sick and it turned out that the AC eventually died and the AC guy was fixated on where this AC was draining and it turned out it was blocked and everything was clogged up and there, there, there was mold in the house. Um, but we actually left that place and then I felt much better, so. Well, actually, that's one of the first rules of toxicology. Uh, get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. So when you are in a situation like yours, you did the right thing is that you left right. uh, the exposure. Uh, and then um, if you would have stayed, then you would have had also the risk of mycotoxins getting at you. Uh, molds are kind of like the gun. Mycotoxins are kind of like the bullet. Mm. So one can hurt you, but right. the mycotoxins, the mycotoxins are, worse. Be, are much worse. They're toxin, so they're much, much worse. So by leaving, can you get rid of the mycotoxins? It depends on mainly two things. One is how long is the exposure. If the mm. exposure is several years in a moldy environment, or even it could be at work. You mm. could be working in a, at, a, at a place where there's mold. Uh, so how long you've been there, and the other is how, what is the state of your immune system? You know, are, do you exercise, do you eat carefully, you select your foods, uh, what you imbibe, etc., or are you pretty much uh, none of those things, couch potatoes, so on and so forth, which all have an effect on our metabolism as well as the immune system. Right. So if you've got a pretty strong immune system and you haven't exposed, have not been exposed that long, you can probably handle it. Your own immune system can probably handle it. However, there's a lot of people that are not aware and a lot of doctors are not aware of the symptoms because they're very general symptoms, very, uh, you know, fatigue, memory loss, short-term memory loss, headaches, joint aches and pains, GI disturbance, sleep disturbance, tremors, et cetera, so they go to the doctor and the doctor treats one or two symptoms and the patient continues, continues, they get checked for their usual blood tests uh, and these come out normal. So unless you're looking, uh, the doctor is aware of that, and a lot of patients get tested actually for Lyme's because some of these symptoms are similar to Lyme's disease, however, there's a cross-reactivity between Lyme and and molds. Mm. So you get a blood test for limes, you actually could be suffering from molds. You get mm. positive for molds, you actually could be suffering from Lyme. And there's, uh, in the medical literature, there's uh, studies which show that those people who have prolonged limes, otherwise, in other words, chronic, the chronic form, may actually be suffering from something else. Um, and the important thing is how to test for it. You, if you test for antibodies to molds, you're really, you could have stayed in a moldy motel at one time. Right, just had past exposure. Yes, so you know you have, right. you have the antibodies to it. Sure. 
However, if you do antibodies to mycotoxins, that, well, you don't want mycotoxins. Yeah, because mycotoxins is the bullets. That's right. So, um, anyway, how did you get into this uh, field? Like, um, um, uh, Well, it w I used to see a lot of patients in my practice, and then because I did good, um, I got a lot of doctors sending me their families, et cetera. Right. So um, I, 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 my practice grew in area, and I noticed that there was a certain group of women who all had the same similar complaints, whether they're older or younger or anything in between. They had one commonality. They had silicone breast implants. This was back in the 80s, mm. late 80s and, right. and 90s. So with a few colleagues, we published some studies about silicone, which is medically or chemically speaking, polydimethylsiloxane, mm -hmm. and how it affects the rest of the body and the immune system, et cetera. So then the FDA came along and says, put a moratorium on any, any more breast implants until the manufacturers could show them that they're really doing it more right. carefully. However, upon explantation, say there's, a, there's a, a rack and a woman hits the steering wheel, one pops open, ruptures, and the other one is still okay. Well, when you, the okay one is removed to be replaced or anything like that, instead of being a kind of an icy blue color, they'd come out with brownish, blackish, greenish things floating around it. So a, uh, a PhD uh, in pathology started analyzing these and there are molds in them. So my patients who'd come after being explanted say, you know, I feel about 20% better, but I need, to f but I'm not back. I thought I'd be well by now. Mm -hmm. So I started giving them an anti, a general antifungal, mm -hmm. nitroconazole, uh, because antifungals are like antibiotics. There's, they're very either broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. Right. This is a broad, broad right. spectrum antifungal. I gave them the antifungal, and wow, the clouds went away, the sun shone, shines again, et cetera. W was, was it within a week of being on the antifungal or within Usually a within month? a month or two. So a month to six weeks, they'll either get the effect or not, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then people started coming to see me and saying, I heard you, this patient you treated for mold got better. I have mold in my home. So, so then that's how it. So that's how you got into it, the mold world. It, it grew that way. Toxins. And th there was a lot of literature, but doctors didn't seem to read it. And, and I had to read it because right. I had these people sure. coming to see me. I had to help them. It's amazing how one patient led to another, and before you know it, you're, you're, you're yes. kind of in that deep world. So. so now we're, I don't know, 15 to 20 publications in PubMed on molds and mycotoxins. So, you know, you, I'm, I'm trying to get other doctors to understand, especially um, to try and help them understand how to diagnose and how to treat. So the treatment is generally itraconazole 250 milligrams or 200, 200 milligrams? 200 milligrams uh, twice a day. Twice a day for six weeks, three months? Anywhere. You really, you know, some patients after 30 days, they were fine. Other patients, it was six weeks. Other patients, it was two months. I mean, every... It's variable. Yeah, it varies patient to patient. And you cycle the... Um, Itraconazole? No. No, just one-time therapy and it will be just fine. Straight through. Interesting. So that's really remarkable. Silicon breast that's brown. Do you think that, I mean, it had to happen years ago before the trauma, let's say, in a car accident where one of the silicon breasts uh, pops out. I mean, do you think there's a micro tear that basically that's how? Um, no. The... Uh, uh, Breast implants were grandfathered in by the FDA after the FDA was formed. So there was never any oversight on or, or any reduction. studies or, or anything that had to be submitted. And the way in, in one particular manufacturer did it is they checked what the integrity of the implant to make sure there's no holes or tears by blowing in them, literally like that. Hmm. So <laughs> with that kind of uh, production line, you're going to get you're going to have problems eventually. So there, there was mold to begin with that, uh, that wasn't seen and right. then over time because of the production, yeah. sloppy production. Now, of course, that problem has been resolved okay. and the new implants are, are made properly and, and so on and so forth.
That's really interesting. I had no idea about that. That's uh, wow. So thank God somebody uh, actually checked out and see what, what what that brown black material was. Really interesting. So um, anyway, do you have experience with lime and with uh, basically mold, yeah. and do you treat both? I had a lot of patients that came to see me and um, that basically they. I remember one father and mother brought their 21-year-old daughter. When she was 17, she went to a summer camp in New England. And dad was an oil executive, and uh, he flew around a lot. And so his daughter was at that summer camp for six weeks. Apparently she got bit by a tick and developed limes. Well, she, okay, so then they did the limes treatment. Uh, make a long story short, she'd been on Lyme's treatment for four years and was no better. And she almost didn't graduate from her s school because of days off being sick and getting IVs and all this. Um, and they're getting worried because her daughter's getting older, she wants to go to college, she's right. very intelligent, and so on and so forth. So they, somebody told them, you know, it may not be Lyme's. Have you thought about mold? And they looked me up and found me. So they came to see me. Sure enough, when I did the tests on her, her mycotoxin levels were elevated for antibodies. And so I immediately started treating her for mold mycotoxin treatment. And six months later, she was well. And the parents were kind of a little surprised. They said, do you have any idea how much money we spent in four years? And here you come along and you take care of this in six months. And they were upset, not at me or their daughter, but at what had happened, the experience they'd been through. Well, anyway, it, it, sometimes it happens that way. Yes, it's, it's true. It's, we've had many patients, so I've had, you know, uh, I've seen them in those cases there too. So generally, the, the mold testing, the um, um, microtoxins testing, if you had to pay cash, just because uh, probably not covered under insurance, but let's say for a cash price, in general, do you, how much would that cost? The mycotoxin yeah, test. Yeah, mycotoxin. I think um, somewhere between four and five hundred dollars for seven different okay. mycotoxins: IgA, IgM, IgG for okay. each one. So really, you're talking about twenty-one parameters. Got it. Okay, just for uh, future patients that are interested in doing therapy, they. I should know on you know what the diagnostic testing would cost. All right, so thank you very much. That was uh, very educational, and look forward to listening to your talk. <laughs>